Okay, so first of all, I, I would like to thank um, everybody and especially Karen and uh, Eric for this uh, beautiful conference despite uh, the, the pandemic. And uh, I think uh, I, I couldn't hope uh, a better uh, conference for the moment. And um, well, I should also uh, greet Dirk for his birthday. That's obvious, but uh, I would also like to thank him for what he did, especially these uh, uh, half algebras of uh, graphs and, uh, and trees, because as uh, Reimar said, we have started working on that maybe more than 20 years ago. And I remember very well that I was a, a, post, um, a PhD student and I first met Dirk, uh, I don't remember the, the, the exact year, in maybe 1997, and he was invited uh, in Marseille, not by, by our group, but by Robert Cocro, to talk about, uh, about uh, notes and uh, Feynman graphs. And I remember very well uh, to have seen him uh, at a bus stop, and uh, ask him uh, whether he knows how to go to the institute because I wanted to to, to help him uh, as a as a young PhD student. I thought that this was a, a necessary service I I should give uh, to to Dirk and uh, and uh, and this was my first uh, encounter. And after that, <clears throat> he uh, started to uh, to propose the whole algebra of uh, Feynman graphs. And this had a very profound influence on the topics I, I, I have been working on because uh, it, uh, it shed a new light for me on renormalization in, uh, in various uh, frameworks. And especially, as Anna has said yesterday, the fact that you can summarize the BPHD formulation of renormalization in a, a single equation, which is a Birkhoff type factorization, was in fact, it's certainly one of the most beautiful equation you can, you can write about uh, quantum field theory. So uh, I'm very indebted to, to Dirk for all this. And I've been uh, working still then from time to time on uh, cohn kreimer hoff algebras. In fact, <clears throat> those algebras have uh, at least three aspects. So one of them is combinatorial. So they can be used to, uh, to develop some um, power series with index uh, being graphs instead of integers. And then you can substitute one power series into the other. And this leads directly to the co-product of, uh, of the Hopf algebra because the coefficients of the power series are a uh, character of the Hopf algebra and the multiplication of these uh, characters is just uh, uh, reading the coefficients of the, of the power series obtained by composing two power series. So this is the combinatorial aspect, but there is also behind that a uh, group theoretical aspect because, uh, because uh, the characters form a group and uh, it's a kind of Lie group because there is a Lie algebra. You can also think of it infinitesimally. And that's very useful and uh, also, in my opinion, uh, a very deep aspect, as has been uh, noticed by Alain during his talk yesterday. And finally, perhaps the most interesting aspect, but uh, less studied, uh, at least by myself, is uh, the analytic aspect, because uh, especially this Birkhoff decomposition uh, hides uh, an important analytic aspect that you can factorize a function of some uh, complex variable z into an uh, analytic function of z and an analytic function of one over z. This is a Birkhoff uh, type factorization. So in my talk, I will mostly uh, focus on uh, this point here. So uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, combinatorial points. So it will be certainly less demanding than other talks because uh, everything is quite visual. You, you don't have really uh, hardcore computations. And the summary of this talk is 
that I will start with a gentle reminder of uh, Hopf algebras of uh, graphs and trees. Then I will introduce uh, random tensors because uh, it, uh, among all the possible occurrences of uh, Hopf algebras in, in various uh, uh, fields, various models of uh, in physics, in fact, it, it appears very naturally in, in random tensors. And this is what I would like to explain. This will be probably the, the, the main part of my talk. And then there is also topological recursion. So topological recursion is uh, something which appeared uh, less than a decade ago. I think it goes back to uh, 2007 or five. I don't remember exactly. It has been proposed uh, by, uh, by uh, Bertrand Hénard and uh, Nicolas Rontin. It's an extremely powerful technique. And in the talk of Reimer, uh, we have seen how, how powerful this technique is. And it allows you to compute order by order some, some, some quantity. In, in the original setup, it was uh, correlation functions of, of uh, random matrices. And it then invaded many uh, areas of physics. Uh, you can, uh, for instance, think of uh, the work of Mirzakhani on the volume of uh, moduli spaces and also of uh, physics because uh, those, uh, this work of Mirzakhani has been recently used in uh, JT gravity, so Jacques uh, Teichelpalm gravity. And that's somewhat complicated because it really relies on the analytic aspect of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the theory. But recently, Konsevich and Zoibelman have found a more algebraic approach, which uh, is uh, easier to explain. Uh, well, of course, when you do the actual computation, you have to use this, the analytic properties. And even in the paper of Konsevich and Zoibelman, uh, it's, uh, the, the, the analytic approach is, is, uh, is used to, to treat all the examples. But you can formulate this in a relatively simple way as a kind of WKB expansion. And here, I will just uh, tell, uh, show you how, uh, in fact, the combinatorial aspect of the, of the cohen kramer hopf algebra appear. So to summarize, this will be more combinatorial than algebraic or analytic. And uh, I, I hope I will uh, be able to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to convince you of uh, the, the underlying uh, um, relevance of, of that of Hoff algebra in, in the case I, I will consider. But there are many other occurrences. So just to quote three of them, where on which I've been working myself. So the Polshinsky's exact renormalization group equation, the multi-scale expansion in, uh, in um, quantum field theory, or even graph polynomials. So for instance, there is a, a very famous graph polynomial, which is a, the Tut polynomial. And it is a polynomial which assigns some value, uh, some, polyno some polynomial value to, to every graph. And it can be characterized by a uh, relation of uh, dilation and contraction of an edge. And those relations can be uh, fruitfully formulated in terms of Hopf algebra because the character, the, the polynomial assigning a, a graph, assigning to a graph a polynomial value, uh, obeys the dilation contraction relation, which turns out. So, so this polynomial, this map from a graph to uh, a, a polynomial defines in fact a character of the Hopf algebra. And the fact that it obeys a deletion and contraction relation, in fact is, uh, uh, is translated into a differential equation for the character. And this differential equation can be solved as a product of exponential. So again, I think this is a, a, a nice and beautiful thing because it allows to uh, treat in a single um, 
in a single step, the, the graph polynomial just as a map from polynomial from graphs to polynomials. So I will not talk about that uh, because I have decided to focus more on uh, on random tensors because that's a subject of my personal interest and uh, but. There are references, and of course, uh, there are many other occurrences uh, I have not quoted here. Okay, so let's continue. So I will first introduce the Hopf algebra of graphs. So it's a free commutative algebra generated by uh, classes of uh, connected and irreducible graphs, and it has a core product which is uh, defined this way. So you take delta of gamma. Delta of gamma is always gamma tens one plus one tens gamma. So sorry, I think I should uh, activate something here. My screen. Oh, you can see, you can see it. So it's uh, always gamma tensor one plus one tensor gamma, this is always present. Then you have a sum over all disjoint proper connected subgraph of the product of all those subgraphs. So this can be considered as a single disconnected subgraph. And then you reduce the, all those subgraphs to single vertices inside the graph gamma. Okay, so it seems that, okay, that's not, uh, let me just, yeah. So, uh, okay, so now I'm be, I will be able to, to, uh, to uh, write on. So this co-product, these connected graphs uh, have been extracted from uh, the graph gamma and on one side and have been contracted to single vertices on the other side. Of course, for that to be consistent, if you contract a graph, say, with a certain number of external legs, say four external legs, then you will contract it to a single. Okay, so you will contract it to a single vertex. Then it means that inside your theory, you must have the four valent vertex. OK, now <clears throat> let's uh, see how it works on an example. Suppose that I take the phi free theory. So phi free theory, which is uh, this uh, simple, uh, simple example here. Okay, so <laughs> in, in, in case you have uh, just free valent vertex, Then you have uh, that uh, example. You take this uh, free loop uh, correction to the self energy. Then you always have this gamma tensor one plus one tensor gamma. Then you extract gamma one, which is, which is for instance, this graph. You get this formula and this you contract it to a single vertex. And in fact, I didn't write the, the vertex here. And you can do it in two different ways, either by taking this one or this one. So you get this factor of two here, but you can also contract separately uh, all the two graphs here, and then you get this to the square times one. But the graph being supposed to be irreducible, you will not contract the whole uh, graph made by the, this followed by this. Okay, you, you don't do this. This um, co-product, in fact, uh, relies on a hierarchy of uh, subgraphs, which is uh, well captured by a tree. For instance, you can draw a rooted tree whose root is the overall graph and whose uh, two leaves are the two uh, subgraphs here. And if you had another one inside, then you could draw another one inside and so on. And then the tree will be more complicated. 
Okay, so this brings us to uh, the Hopf algebra of uh, rooted trees, which is a second example of interest to us. So the Hopf algebra of rooted trees is uh, again a free commutative algebra generated by rooted trees with a coproduct. And the coproduct is always of the same form, t tensor one plus one tensor t, then a sum over admissible cuts. So an admissible cut is a removal of edges such that from the root to the edges, to the leaves, every edge is removed, uh, every path from the root to the edge sees only one removed edges, one removed edge. Then it turns out that uh, the tree may be separated in several parts. There is one part which is called RC of T, which uh, contains the initial root. And then there are several pruned uh, subtrees, which are the trees that fall when you, once you have cut. So again, if I take an example here, if I want to have the co-product of, uh, of that graph, then it's uh, going to be, uh, again, the tree times one plus one times the tree. Then if you uh, cut any of the two uh, edges, which are uh, just above the, the two leaves, then you get the first term. You can also cut two of them, the two uh, separately, then you get uh, the square of the of the of the single of the tree with a single vertex times the tree with two vertices, and then you can cut the, the tree, the the edge which is just below the root. Of course, you don't cut two edges uh, like uh, you don't cut the the edges here and the edge here because in that case you will not have an admissible cut. Okay. Now, this, those rooted trees are uh, almost everywhere in, uh, in uh, our perturbative computations because they obey a universal property. And this universal property is mainly uh, due to the fact that uh, a given tree can be, um, uh, can be uh, constructed by uh, gluing several uh, subtrees to the root. And this operation is uh, an important operation because it allows to have uh, all the inductive constructions on the trees. And whenever you can uh, formulate one problem uh, using such an inductive construction, so if you want to start with an object of large size, and then you can reduce the, the statement you want to prove to a statement about uh, several objects of smaller sizes, which can be, in a sense, uh, glued together to uh, an elementary object to give, um, to give uh, the, 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 the larger object you, have, you are studying, then you can formulate your program using uh, rooted trees. So <clears throat> the rooted trees, a, and the, the, the graphs, the rooted trees and the graphs are particular cases of graded Hopf algebras or commutative graded Hopf algebras. So uh, these are bigebras of the type, it's a graded as an algebra, so it's a, a direct sum indexed by integers, and the product obeys a standard grading rule the co-product obeys a dual uh, grading rule, whereas the grading is, of course, n here. It is important in, uh, to have uh, h0, which is proportional to c, which gives us an antipode, which is 0 unless uh, x is uh, a member of h0. So this type of uh, graded bigebra, commutative, are in fact Hopf algebras because you can define an antipode by recursion. So <clears throat> in the case of the graphs, then the grading may be the number of edges or the number of cycles, or in the case of trees, the grading uh, is the number of vertices. 
So both come equipped with uh, an antipod. Moreover, if I consider the characters on uh, such an algebra, then uh, the, the characters are algebra morphism from the off algebra H to any commutative ring, which means that they will be uh, in particular this multiplicativity condition, then they form a group for the convolution product. So the convolution product is just uh, A star H, alpha star H, which is uh, this formula, M, uh, the multiplication of alpha uh, and beta evaluated on both sides of the coproduct. The identity of the group is the co-unit and the inverse is obtained by composing with the antipode. This group has uh, the interesting property of being a Lie group in the sense that you can define a notion of infinitesimal character, which is uh, delta of gamma gamma prime is delta of gamma epsilon of gamma prime plus epsilon gamma delta of gamma prime. And this form, this, this infinitesimal character form a Lie algebra. And this is precisely the Lie algebra of the group G, because uh, every alpha can be written as an exponential of, of a delta. And conversely, you can get delta by, um, by a logarithm of alpha. And all this is per perfectly well defined as a formal power series uh, because of the grading. So at each step, you have uh, only a finite number of uh, additional multiplication to perform. Okay, so um, let's come to uh, the use of the renormalization and the characters of uh, the alpha algebra of uh, graphs in perturbative quantum field theory. So um, in perturbative quantum field theory, we are interested by uh, computing the correlation function or green function, uh, which are the expectation values of products of uh, fields and they expand over Feynman graphs. And if you compute the expectation of a product of n fields, then you have <clears throat> Feynman graph with n external legs. And those n external legs are decorated by the positions x1, xn at which the fields are evaluated, or in Fourier transform, uh, the momenta entering into the Feynman graphs through the external leg. As you all know here, these amplitudes are most of the case divergent. So uh, they cannot be properly defined just by taking the Feynman rules. You need to regulate this, uh, these divergences. One way which is uh, very popular is to regulate divergences using dimensional regularization. So you will evaluate any of these amplitudes using the Feynman rules in a complex dimension. And this complex dimension, uh, I, I will denote it by D minus Z, and Z is a, a deviation from the physical dimension, and D is supposed to be the physical dimension. The divergences are uh, cancelled by uh, replacing, in fact, the action S by a new action, which is the initial action, plus some counter terms. And once you suitably choose the counter terms as a function of Z and of some of the renormalization procedure you have chosen, then you can write down finite amplitudes for every Feynman graph. Now, here comes the main theorem um, I want to uh, to uh, to present in this uh, section is a theorem by Kohn and Kramer. It goes back to uh, the late 90s. Now, in fact, since you assign a value to every Feynman graph, then you have a, a character of the of the Hopf algebra, and <clears throat> let's write phi gamma the regularized amplitude A gamma, which is a Lorentz series in Z. 
let's call phi minus the counter term. In fact, it's a <coughs> it's a pole part for the graph gamma. It's not the pole part of the amplitude. It's uh, much more complicated, but it's uh, some pole part that will cancel the divergence in a gamma. But before canceling the divergence in a gamma, you are first to cancel the divergence in all the subgraphs. This was uh, this was said by Alain already yesterday, and he he this is what he called the preparation. And then phi plus of gamma is the renormalized and finite amplitude, which is uh, finitely assigned, finally, sorry, finally assigned to the graph A gamma. Now they are all related by this equation, phi plus is phi minus star phi. And this just says that you have to uh, do the computation with phi, but you have to insert not the original uh, parameters, but the renormalized parameters taking into account, uh, the, not the renormalized the bare parameters taking into account the effect of the counter terms. And if you put, uh, if you write it differently, you multiply by phi minus one, you have that this map phi, which is a power series in z and z minus one, can be factorized as a power series in z minus one and a power series in z. Okay, so <clears throat> this is, uh, I guess, well known to everybody here, but uh, I I wanted to to present it because I because this is precisely the work of Dirk, which I alluded in in the beginning and uh, and which made the renormalization uh, as as uh, as concise as as possible using this equation but moreover it's it started also to uh, to produce analogies with many different fields and i hope i will be able to uh, present one of these later now something Similar but different can be said about uh, rooted trees. So the characters of rooted trees can also be interpreted as a kind of uh, power series. So uh, this is uh, Butcher's B series. It goes back to uh, to uh, uh, Butcher, which was a mathematician from New Zealand, I think, if I remember well. And he was uh, studying uh, differential equations. And in particular, he noticed that uh, you can uh, compose and inverse runge kutta method, methods. And so there is a group. And this group is precisely the group, which is um, the group of characters of uh, the Hopf algebra of rooted trees. So let me <coughs> just uh, explain a few elementary things here. If I have a rooted tree, T and a nonlinear operator X. So this should be considered as a, a, a smooth map from uh, one Banach space to another one, for instance. Then this map can be raised to the power of the tree. What is this? First, you have to divide by the automorphism of the tree. So the number of uh, transformation of edges and vertices that preserve the tree. Here, my trees are not embedded trees. So I don't care whether the vertices are this way or this way. So I can permute uh, all the leaves and, and all the, the edges. Only the root is uh, distinguished. So apart from this purely combinatorial factor, which is just a number like one third here, one over two here, or one third or one over factorial, then it will come equipped with a combination of differentials of the operator X. So for instance, uh, I will start from the leaf, from the root. Then from the root, there is one outgoing edge. Then I will um, differentiate once. Then I arrive at the next edge. Then I will differentiate twice, X double prime. And then at the end, I arrive at the two leaves where I differentiate uh, I don't differentiate because there is no outgoing edges. So edges are always oriented from the root to the edge. And I combine all these operators. So this, 
the first uh, with x prime, x double prime is an abstract notation based on differential calculus, but you can have a more concrete version using partial derivatives. So xi is the root, then I derive with respect to xj, which is the uh, next uh, outgoing edges. Then I arrive at uh, xj for the second vertex. Then there are two outgoing edges. When then I derive twice and I contract finally with a leaves. This is very fine because then you can say that I will compose power series of nonlinear operators indexed by trees and the composition uh, exactly reproduces the um, re exactly reproduces the uh, convolution product on uh, the characters of the rooted tree. This is equation 11. And of course, uh, there is a very simple example. If the operator is linear, so if X is really a linear map, then there is no uh, second order differential, and then there is no branching of the tree, and then you have just a linear tree. And of course, in the general case, this is always evaluated at x. So uh, you, you have to evaluate it at x so that this is a map from x to x, from e to e, from the Banach space to itself. So this is a function of x. And this allows the composition to be possible. And among the uh, simplest possible series, there is a geometric series. So the, suppose that you want to solve this equation, x equals x0 plus capital X acting on x, then you just have to invert 1 minus capital X and 1 minus capital X minus 1. In fact, you can view it as a geometric series. So it's the sum of all the trees with a, with a weight 1. OK? And this is precisely what you obtain if you solve that equation uh, recursively, you start with x0, then you put x0 inside uh, capital X of x, and then you get x0 plus capital X of x0. Then you do it again, and you get uh, order by order, you get all those trees. Okay, so um, that is the framework I want to uh, use in the following slides, so in the remaining part of my talk. And the first topic I would like to discuss is the theory of random tensors. So random tensors are natural generalization of random matrices. So a random matrix is a matrix Mij subject to a probability law. And the generalization is just to add several indices. So a rank R tensor is an object T with R indices. So I, J, and K, and so on. And I assume that all those indices take values from 1 to N. So if I equals 2, then you have a N by N matrix. Now, the theory is random, which means that we are interested in computation, in computing expectation values of observables uh, which are just functions of the tensor. So the expectation value of O of T is just uh, the average of O of T with a weight which is exponential minus Vn of T. Vn of T is uh, a given potential. I will give uh, examples later. And it is assumed to depend on N because uh, most of the time we are interested in taking the limit N goes to infinity. There are several applications to this. The first application is, in fact, the original one. It was uh, it was an attempt to um, to uh, give a sum to give um, a meaning to a sum of random uh, triangulations in dimension D, with a view towards quantum gravity, because. Uh, random matrices are related to two-dimensional quantum gravity, and it was hoped 
that uh, a similar relation can uh, occur in dimension D. So this was a hope in the early 90s, but it has been recently uh, in the last uh, decade, it has been uh, made more uh, likely because uh, <clears throat> at the, uh, since uh, these uh, recent years, uh, a, a very uh, a lot of progress have been made in identifying the triangulations that contribute at leading order in N, so the equivalent of the genius expansion in random matrices, especially by uh, Rasman Guro, Vincent Ribasso, and many people like that. Another possible application is uh, to consider a random tensor like uh, random coupling constant. So suppose that I have a n vector model, so a quantum field theory, or even a, a, a usual vector with n components, phi i, then I can say, okay, let's write an interaction for such a theory. The interaction of the of this theory must um, combine several uh, several um, fields, and since the field has a vector index i, then it's uh, natural to ask for the coupling constant to be a tensor of rank r if you have r fields, and then it's uh, possible to consider a model with a random coupling constant. So you will uh, do your computations using your coupling constant G, J. And then after all, after this has been done, you will average the result over the coupling constant. And since the coupling constant is a tensor, then you will use a technique of a random tensors. And this is precisely what is done in uh, the Sashdef ye kitayev model. So I am not going to enter into the details here, but this is a model, a quantum mechanical model, in fact. So in that model, phi is just a function of time. It's fermionic. And uh, <clears throat> once you have average uh, over the random tensor with a Gaussian weight, and you take the large end limit, then the famous schwinger dyson equation uh, for that model are uh, simplified a lot and they are exactly solvable. So you can write down uh, an exact solution for the two point function. And it's uh, in fact in, in, the, in the infrared limit and uh, it's a strong coupling model uh, problem. So it's, uh, it's not trivial to, it's not uh, expected to have an exact solution in a, in a strong coupling limit. It's very nice. It has been pro proposed uh, in the 90s as a model for uh, condensed matter, but it has been recently um, used by Kitayev as a toy model for the ADS1 CFT2 uh, model. Uh, no, ADS2 CFT1 uh, correspondence. Okay, so. <clears throat> Here are the definitions of uh, random tensors. Now, uh, we would like to have a potential which is invariant under some ON or UN transformations. A tensor uh, may transform this way, equation 16, uh, where O is here uh, chosen to be uh, an element of the orthogonal group. But if you have a con complex tensor, there is uh, also the possibility of having uh, UN transformations. Now, if we want to have something which is invariant under these transformations, then we have to generalize the trace. The trace was uh, a way to construct a lot of invariants in dimension two, so for random matrices. But if you want to work with random tensors, then you have to generalize that a bit. And one way to generalize it is to use graphs. So I will develop the potential over some graphs, which are uh, made as follows. If I have a rank R tensor, I will uh, construct graphs uh, with vertices of uh, degree R. And then I will 
assign the tensor to the vertices and contract them along the edges of the, of the graph. So I'll give examples just right after. So it will be uh, crystal clear, I think. But before, let me just say that x of gamma is a certain coupling constant. So it's just a number. And it will be used also to generate expectation values by derivation. And s gamma is a certain power uh, of n, which I have to choose in order to have a, a nice uh, finite uh, limit in the when n goes to infinity for some observables. Now let me give a few examples of those uh, invariants. So for instance, the dipole graph, which is just two vertices related by, by edges. So and each vertex is assigned a tensor and the tensor are contracted uh, along the edges. So here, i goes to i, g goes to j, k goes to k, which are the three uh, edges here. There is this graph, which is called a melon. So uh, that doesn't look at all like a melon, but uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, it's hard to explain why it's called a melon. Uh, it's uh, this graph, which is called the quartic melon because you have uh, four uh, vertices. Now each vertex is assigned a tensor and uh, you contract, for instance, the two vertices on the left are contracted with uh, two edges. So ij, ij and they k and l contract to uh, the two tensor on the right, which are themselves contracted using m and l. Similarly, you can also uh, consider a tetrahedral graph, and then you contract uh, the tensor along the tetrahedron, and all those gener generalize what is known for random uh, matrices uh, with uh, the, uh, the, the trace. Now, <clears throat> just be very quick about that because time is uh, going to be a bit uh, short. So um, here I've been talking for tensors in general, but if you want to have a larger limit, it is, uh, it is better to work with a complex non-symmetric tensor. So you have T and T bar and you don't assume any permutations of any permutational symmetry of the edges. So this is, <clears throat> it's very nice because uh, then you can have a, a very rigid uh, structure of graph because you have to, to color the, the edges by, by, the, by indices, which uh, by, by, uh, by numbers from one to, to D or to R, which will tell us uh, what is the rank of the indices being contracted. And then you can uh, prove that the large end limit exists and only uh, a particular class of graph is involved. These are the so-called melonic graphs where you have uh, the properties that a melonic graph, for every vertex, there is a companion and conjugate vertex such that when you remove the two vertices, then the graph falls into um, exactly R connected component, R being the rank of the tensor, which I write uh, D sometime. Now, let me now uh, try to derive the schwinger dyson equation in the uh, random tensor partition function. So by this, I mean that I will make a change of variable in the uh, partition function, and I will look at what happens. So the change of variable must be uh, for my uh, purpose, uh, a polynomial in the tensor and respect all the symmetries. So the best way to do this is to uh, index the uh, monomials occurring in the change of variable by a graph gamma with one at uh, vertex removed. So suppose that I take here the quartic melon and if I remove a vertex, I have this uh, contribution here. And this contribution here has still three uh, three indices and these three, three indices will be used to define the tensor here because uh, uh, the, the, um, when I have removed the vertex, I don't have a scalar anymore, I have a, a tensor. So I perform this kind of change of variables into the, uh, the tensor, the tensor model partition function. 
and there are two contributions, a Jacobian and a variation from the uh, from the uh, integrator and in fact from the potential here. Now, the two contributions uh, uh, are slightly different. So first, the variation of a, from the potential. It, it occurs because every graph invariant appearing in the potential is modified by the change of variable. So modified by this change of variable. And the modification is, is very simple to understand. You take a graph, then you take this <coughs> delta t, and you insert it at uh, the vertices. Here you will, because this is a tensor t and not a tensor t bar, you will insert it only at the white vertices. And then you will get from that graph to that graph. So uh, this operation is just uh, opening a graph. So you remove a vertex and then you insert. Now the Jacobian <coughs> comes from uh, the trace of the derivative of delta t. So when you uh, when you have a delta t, which takes, for instance, the, the, the form of the open graph here, then if you want to, uh, to take the derivative, then you have to remove another vertex, and then you take the trace and you reconnect everything. So on the example on, on the, the last line, you will remove the two central vertices, so this is one removal is the definition of dt. The second removal comes from the fact that you derive then with respect to t, and then you reconnect everything. So in that case, you obtain that contribution. Now, the tensor model partition function should be invariant under this change. And it turns out that this can be written as a differential operator L gamma acting on Z. Why differential operator? Because all the, all the graph you will collect from uh, this operation will be, uh, will be rewritten as a derivative with respect to uh, the parameter X gamma. And this generalizes the um, Virazor constraint you have in the matrix model. They are indexed by uh, graphs, gamma. And the nice thing is that now, uh, in fact, they reproduce the uh, Lie algebra structure of the cohen kramer hopf algebra. Because <coughs> you have uh, already noticed that uh, when you took one of these graph invariant and you remove, um, you remove a, a vertex, it means that you will open the graph, so you will have a, uh, uh, an algebra of uh, graphs with r external legs, r being the rank of the tensor, and then all operation will be just substitution of those uh, graphs into uh, other graphs to get bigger graphs. And this is precisely what is done by uh, the cohn kramer hopf algebra. Uh, better to say that the cohn kramer hopf algebra does the opposite. It disentangles a big graph into uh, subgraphs, but here you are working in the dual and uh, it's uh, perfectly fine. And uh, you can moreover show that the group of characters of the Hopf algebra is in fact the group associated to this, to this Lie algebra. And again, in the case of uh, random matrices, and you have uh, just a trace invariant, and then it's indexed not by a graph, but just by uh, an integer number, and you find back the Birazor algebra. The only difference uh, with respect to uh, matrices is that, of course, the, the graph are more complicated than the integer, but the main difference is the fact that you have a differential operator of higher order here. Because as you have seen, if you have a, a graph with a vertex with vertices of balance R, then by removing a pair of vertices, you can get R connected components. And this is why you have this differential operator of order R here. Now, this uh, Virazo constraint, or they are a different form of the loop equations. 
and uh, they, the loop equation are at the root of the topological recursion. So in the last years, uh, Konsevich and Zoiberman have proposed to, uh, to, uh, to revisit uh, topological recursion in the language of uh, deformation quantization. And in fact, in the WKB language. So let me introduce what is called a quantum airy structure. So a quantum airy structure is just a quadratic differential operator of the type given by equation 26. The important point is that the first term is just the ordinary derivative, then you have a quadratic uh, polynomial, then you have uh, a differential operator with uh, x and d, and then you have a second order differential operator, and then you have a, a, a constant term. The constant term always comes with an h, and all the differential operator always come with an h, which plays the role of h bar. Now, uh, what is it good for? In fact, if you assume that they obey a Lie algebra, those operators, then you can show that there is a unique power series which satisfies the equation Li acting on exponential of s divided by h bar is equal to zero. So you can find a unique uh, WKB action s. The, the, the first exponential is, is uh, useless here, but I've, I, I put it for, for some reason, but it's useless here because uh, Li acting on exponential equal to zero is equivalent to that equation. The important idea is that you uh, impose that you start with g greater than one or n greater than three. This is precisely topological recursion. Uh, there is a long route from this equation to topological recursion. In fact, you can, uh, you can look at uh, papers, uh, original paper by uh, Konsevich and Zoiberman, but also there are very good reviews by, by uh, Gaetan Borot, uh, we, we, uh, who, who wrote uh, uh, lectures about that. It's um, very interesting. So this is precisely topological recursion, but written in a, in a different format. I will stick here to this format, and then I will uh, slightly enlarge it. So I will uh, add perturbation by differential operators of higher order because I'm interested by the um, by the random tensor models, and I will show a similar result, except that I have Li which contains higher order terms and Di uh, as zero because I have uh, allowed for initial terms, while in the konsevich Zoberman paper, it was, it, they started with, so now I, I, I don't know where I am anymore. Uh, I, I have to finish, so I, yeah. So I want to solve that uh, differential equation and to solve this uh, this uh, differential equation that would give me uh, the WKB uh, solution S, I'm going to use root of trees. So I write it first as a, an equation not for the action S, but for the one form D of S. And for the one form D of S, I can write it in the form omega equals omega zero, so the initial point plus a perturbation. And this is precisely solved by rotor trees. At the end, the Lie algebra structure allows me to check that the one form omega is closed and then that the action indeed exists. Now, the last, uh, uh, last uh, point is to precise that the Hopf algebra, there is a Hopf algebra behind this uh, expansion. It's a Hopf algebra made of graphs which are trees. And those graphs are decorated by, by loop edges. And there is always a loop, the loop edges always go from one uh, vertex to uh, a child. So there is never a, 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 a loop edge between uh, vertices that sit at the same rank on uh, the tree. 
always from a, a parent to a child. And then there are also big vertices, which are blobs, and the blobs represent the, uh, the I of SDO. So all these form a Hopf algebra, and then you can uh, you can combine objects into the other. Okay, so I think I know uh, I'm, my tablet is not always working very nicely. So let's, uh, okay. So there is a Hopf algebra, which is very similar to the Cohen-Kramer Hopf algebra of trees, except that when I do a cut and the, the co-product is always given by cuts, I have also to uh, tackle the loop edges and the loop edges all come contracted to uh, the to some um, to all come contracted to uh, the the pruned subtrees which are contracted to vertices. So you see an example here. And this half algebra is nice in the sense that it can allow you to uh, compose different computations. So you start with an S, you get an S prime, then you can. Uh, continue computing uh, and starting with this S prime to get a new S double prime and so on. So my my last side uh, this uh, way of doing topological re recursion is in fact here what I have been doing is mostly a perturbative expansion. So we have to distinguish. Uh, the perturbative from the topological expansion. In the perturbative expansion, you expand in powers of t. So in fact, you, t is uh, related to the number of edges. So you uh, expand really in Feynman graphs. And if you uh, come back to the to the rooted tree of before, in fact, you will see appearing all the Feynman graphs. But topological expansion is not this. Topological expansion is an expansion in powers of h and and x. So you want, as has been said in the talk by Rama, you want to have an expansion, in fact, in 2 minus 2g minus n. So g is a genus and n is a number of boundaries. This is what is done by <coughs> the koncevich zoibelman approach, because it's really an expansion in, uh, in the powers of h and x. And to come from uh, such a more general expansion to an expansion in powers of uh, h and uh, and x, you have to factorize the leading order term. And this is precisely what is done by topological recursion. If you know the disk and the cylinder, so here the disk will be uh, linear in x uh, or constant for uh, the df over dx and quadratic in f or linear for df over dx. And once you have factorized that, you have to know them, then you input them into the equation and then you get the higher order terms. So <clears throat> I will just um, just uh, just um, end by saying that it's here I've been mentioning mostly some combinatorial aspects. And there is a deep analytical aspect behind both uh, topological recursion and cohn kramer uh, computation in renormalization. And it's uh, very likely to me that there is a Birkhoff decomposition behind the, the behind topological recursion. You have already seen in Heimar stock that there was a, a separation into an analytic term and a non-analytic term. And this works fine at lowest order. I've been able to check, but uh, it remains to find to present this as a as a general uh, theory. So <clears throat> I think I should be in time to finish. And uh, okay, so there is no more slide. Okay, so it's finished. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. For... Thank you so much for your talk. I hadn't seen that different uh, kind of trees with the loop edges ever before, so I, I wasn't aware of this combinatorial underlying of the this Hopf algebraic underlying of the topological recursion. Um, so since well, we are, yeah, uh, since we are a bit behind time, I just want to ask one question from the chat. 
So, so Johannes Turingen was asking that this tensor Lie algebra that you mentioned, uh, is this related to the guro Virazoro algebra? Is there a relation between these? Yes, 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 it's, a, it's precisely that. It's precisely that. In fact, uh, Guro, uh, the Guro uh, derived that, um, that uh, those constraints, and, uh, but he was not uh, aware, at least uh, he didn't tell me that this was a concrete of algebra that I told him. Okay, thank you, Raj. I think that answers the question brilliantly. Um, let's thank Thomas here and leave further questions for the discussion afterwards in the break. Thanks, Thomas.